Hello, it's Wednesday, the 26th of July, 2017, one o'clock Eastern time, and this is Student Affairs Live, the online learning community for student affairs educators in higher education. I'm your host, Heather Shea, broadcasting live from Michigan State University. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. On today's live broadcast, I am talking with five authors of a newly published book on using the CAS standards in practice. Before I introduce my guests today, I need to give a quick shout out to the folks who make these three free webcasts possible. As many of you know who watch regularly, Student Affairs Live is a part of the Higher Ed Live Network. Our episodes offer you direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. You can be a part of our live broadcast by sharing your knowledge. Thanks again to my friend and colleague, Alex Sylvester, for monitoring today's back channel. And also thank you to Mary Beth Drexler Sharp, who will be tweeting from at CAS underscore standards. If you have questions or want to share comments about today's episode, please use the hashtag Higher Ed Live, and we'll do our best to incorporate those into the discussion. You can join me and my brilliant co-host, Tony Duty live on Wednesdays at 1 o'clock, and we'll give a preview of upcoming episodes at the end. Um, and all of our past episodes are free and accessible in our video archives at higheredlive.com. You can also subscribe to our iTunes podcast if you want to listen and not view us. Um, today's episode is made possible by ACPA, College Student Educators International. Support for Student Affairs Live is one of the many ways ACPA provides innovative professional development. You can, if you haven't yet, registered for the 2018 ACPA convention in Houston, Texas. You can learn more by visiting the link that we are tweeting out now. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a digital-first agency committed to tailored solutions that drive real results. The third annual myth-busting survey is currently underway, sponsored by Higher Ed Live, M. Stoner, in partnership with the NRCCUA, which stands for the National Research Center for College and University Admissions. Um, this year's focus is myth-busting enrollment marketing, and they want to say that thank you know the best channels for boosting visibility among prospective teen students and encouraging them to apply for your institution. We want to hear from you. The survey takes about 15 minutes to complete, and we're tweeting out a link now. So now on with today's episode. Student affairs educators, administrators, and faculty looking to use the CAS professional standards to develop or improve student programs and services have a new resource at their disposal. The first companion guide to the CAS professional standards is a jointly published book by ACPA, NASPA, and CAS titled Using the CAS Professional Standards, Diverse Examples of Practice. The book provides real life case studies written by practitioners who have successfully applied the standards in their work. And so on today's episode, I'm talking with the three editors of the book and two chapter authors. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Dean. Hi, Laura. Hi, happy to be with you. Dr. Shannon Dean, no relation. Hi, Shannon. Hi there. <laughs> Dr. Yancey Goley. Hi, Yancey. Hi. Alex Lang. Hello, Alex. Hey, y'all. And Dr. Jen Wells. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, so in your introduction today, I'd like you to kind of provide a general overview of what your role is on your campus. And then if you could briefly discuss your connection to CAS and why you got involved with this project. Um, Nancy, I'm going to start with you today. OK, great. Thanks for having us. We really appreciate this uh, opportunity. So yes, I'm Yancey Gully. I am an assistant professor at Western Carolina University in the beautiful Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. And um, I have been there just a year. Um, and before that, I was at Morgan State University for a couple of years as faculty. And before that, 15 years as a college administrator around the country. Um, and in those 15 years as administrator, you ask about my connection to CAS. And really, that was where it started, um, using CAS as a great resource in my practice every day and with the practice of those staff members I had. Um, and then going into a graduate program later, um, after a, a longer career than some folks, you know, learning even more about the CAS standards in an academic setting, and then now teaching um, how to use the CAS standards for best um, opportunities in your work and for um, quality endeavors in your work. So that's kind of how um, I can connect with CAS. Um, this project, I can get to a bit uh, and a bit about how it came about and, and how I was a part of that process. Great. Thanks so much. Shannon. 
Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So my name is Shannon Dean, and I'm an assistant professor at Texas State University. Uh, prior to this role, I, like Yancey, served as an administrator for 10 years in a variety of functional areas, and so really used CAS to better support my work and to assess learning outcomes and the things that we wanted students to uh, experience while a part of our programs. <clears throat> And how I came to this, working on this book, was Yancey had this wonderful idea. Um, and as a current faculty member, I'm often talking with students about how to use CAS. And it often seems like an overwhelming sort of the CAS standards. And like, how do you go about using these? How do you go about putting these into practice? And so uh, when Yancey suggested this idea, I was like, yes, this sounds like such a great opportunity. And so it's been such a pleasure to be a part of it. Wonderful. Uh, Laura, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm a faculty member at the University of Georgia, starting my 12th year, incredibly enough, mm -hmm. um, and have been involved with CAS in one way or another for, it seems like, most of my adult life. Um, I was introduced to the standards in my graduate program and was able to serve in a self-study uh, at that point and really appreciated uh, the standards. And then when I went into practice, I was um, a director and then a dean of students vice president. I used the standards a lot to inform practice and train staff. And then pretty early um, had an opportunity to join the board as a representative from one of my professional associations and ended up being on the CAS board for about 20 years, um, serving as a member at large, serving as the editor for two terms, and then serving as president. Um, and so I've seen it from several perspectives and now teach it in the classroom. Um, and I'm a real believer that it's kind of a unifying force for us. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Great. Thanks, Laura. Alex, welcome. Hey, hi all. So I'm Alex Lang. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and there. Um, I, as of last Friday, I ended my tenure as assistant director of MSU's LBGT Resource Center, Michigan State University. I'm currently the director of moving operations for myself uh, as I <laughs> begin to transition to the University of Iowa, where I'll be starting my doctoral program this fall. Um, how I've come to CAS is, one, uh, I went to the University of Georgia for my graduate program. I was in Dr. Dean's classes. Dr. Laura Dean, you got to make the differentiation. That's right. <laughs> um, and um, was really trained by people who really loved CAS. And I would say I've, I've, in my professional career, been in relationship with people who have such differing views and attitudes towards CAS, which has both helped really me, help me become a more critical consumer of the CAS standards, um, and really was invited to write a chapter for the book to really talk about being both a new professional, being in a specific functional area, and being at a large public institution, how all of those elements mix together in my use of CAS standards, which I'm really excited to talk about today. Thanks so much, Alex. Jen, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be back and talking about my favorite topic. Um, so my name is Jen Wells. I am an assistant professor at Kennesaw State, which is outside of Atlanta. I am also the director of assessment in the Office of Institutional Effectiveness. So when I was writing this chapter, I was the director of assessment in student affairs. So I came to CAS through the graduate program as well. I took an assistantship working with Laura Dean and decided I loved CAS and became sort of a kind of like an assistant editor and now I'm the editor for CAS. Uh, so love it. Love CAS, love assessment. It is possible. Great. Well, Jen rejoins us. Um, if you haven't seen the past episode, I think it was about two years ago, actually, right, Jen? Um, when you and Barry, Barry Beth uh, joined me to talk about the release of the ninth edition of CAS. Uh, so that's a good primer uh, if you don't know anything about the CAS standards and you're joining us today. But I thought we would start with kind of a, in 10 words or less, what is the purpose of the CAS standards for each of you? Um, so why don't we start with Laura? Absolutely. I, for me, the, the essential purpose of the CAS standards is grounded in quality assurance. Um, the standards are intended to define good practice 
not best practice, threshold good practice um, from the standpoint both of experts, but also a really broad representation of people who can come to consensus around what we ought to be doing both in singular functional areas and in collaboration with each other across campus. So quality assurance, good practice, and promulgation. We need to spread the word. Okay, we'll take those last 10 sentence, 10 words <laughs> instead of the 10 cent. No, I'm just kidding. It's good. Um, Alex, you want to go next for your description of CAS? Yeah, so I would say the purpose of CAS standards is to, and then my 10 words start, um, inform, not dictate practice, and provide historical context. Okay, good, great. Uh, let's see, Shannon, how about Shannon next? So I think the purpose is to provide a framework for the work of student affairs and the functional areas within student affairs. Okay, Yancy. Um, I like to be a creative thinker, so I think CAS standards help support creative thinking grounded in quality practice in higher education. Great, and Jen. Oh, mute. <laughs> I said I would do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> guide continuous improvement efforts and assessment. Great. The reason I started with that question is because I know that for all of us, regardless of our context, our institutions, we might be thinking about CAS has having different purposes. And I think that's one of the best parts about um, this really useful resource and particularly about the book. So Yancy, tell us a little bit about how the book came about and what you hope it contributes um, to the student affairs profession. Sure. Um, so this book came about um, at one of my favorite restaurants in Athens, Georgia, with one of my favorite people, Laura Dean, um, over cocktails, I think, and dinner one night, um, as many of the best ideas do. Um, yep. And we were, we were sitting together one night talking um, just about life and catching up. And um, I think at the time, Laura was teaching the assessment class, maybe, and I was at my job as an administrator trying to convince my colleagues to use the CAS standards in some projects we had going on on campus. And we we're both talking about how she was having some trouble, you know, explaining CAS at the get go to students, especially when they pick up the big, big book, right? The blue book um, and get a little frightened. And I was saying that m my folks on campus just weren't understanding what the CAS standards were and what they could bring to the table. And I said, well, you know, there's bound to be for folks who don't come through a graduate prep program or those that are in one, a guide to how to use these um, and how to turn this blue book into something meaningful um, to those of us who have not had the one-on-one -on -one opportunity to discuss that and learn that. Um, and that was probably six years ago or so. Um, I was an administrator at the time and didn't have any carrot to work on such a project um, in the moment, honestly, that I turned into faculty and needed projects um, for tenure, being quite frank, um, it became one that could be supported financially by my institution with time and energy resources. Um, and so I picked up the phone and called Laura. I said, let's get this idea back on, on track. Um, and we realized quickly that we would need a, a third person to help kind of guide that ship and um, thought of Shannon um, as someone who would um, be a good fit. And I'll, in all honesty, uh, and this is very true, I think from all of our standpoints, the three of us anyway, there were the most fun conference calls over the course ever. of a year that I've ever had. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of how it came about. Um, we started shopping where the book might come from and, you know, some, some serendipity happened in the universe and the three organizations figured it out that we we're trying to do this at the same time. And I can go into long detail, but they came together and realized that they, the three of them wanted this to be their first joint publication together. Um, and it's worked out really well. Um, and so that's kind of where it came from. We're really hoping that the book can, again, guide people in the various uses of the CAS standards. Um, because there's a variety of uses. You know, some people say it's just for assessment. Well, it's not. It's for creation of program. It's for creation of learning outcomes. It's for generating new ideas. It's for getting buy-in for your ideas from administrators if you're managing up. There are all kinds of ways that they're useful. And so the book really highlights those. And I, I hope will, again, spark that creative thinking about how we use um, the CAS standards and the accompanying documents. 
Can you talk a little bit about your intended audience, um, this being the first jointly published book from these different groups? Yeah, I, th I think it's a really wide audience. Um, and uh, if you want to look, NASPA is doing a blog series. Um, they always do. And we just had a new one um, kind of about uses for the, for the text. It might be helpful for your viewers. Um, but really, it's, yes, graduate students and graduate prep programs. Clearly, I'll be using it in my courses in the future, not just because I'm part of the book, but because it's helpful. Um, you know, Chris Wren, who wrote that blog post for us, is talking a lot about how she's going to be using them in her classes. People are excited about that opportunity. Um, it's a great opportunity as well. I know several administrators um, that I've talked to already, um, maybe kind of vice presidents for student affairs or assessment folks in student affairs divisions who are using this as summer read, um, as a collective reading for their faculty and their staff so that they can figure out how to implement um, the CAS standards into practice across a division. So that's really helpful as well in another audience. Um, so I think it's not just graduate programs, but, but people in the field doing this work who want to learn more about it. So Laura, since you were a part of those initial conversations, maybe you can also give some of the historical context sure. um, that situates this book as an important resource for CAS. Absolutely. For a long time. One of the questions that CAS would get most often from people considering using the standards or, or trying to use them was, what does this look like? Can you point me to somebody who's doing it well, somebody who's doing it right? Where are the, and I don't love the phrase best practices, <laughs> but that was the, that was the request. Um, and for us, it, we were reluctant to pick out specific programs um, because institutional contexts differ so much that it was difficult to say, well, this institution is the one or that institution. But we knew over time that there was a real thirst in the field for examples, for um, examples of what this looks like, how you do it, what are the resources, how do you structure it, how do you use it other than for assessment. And so the opportunity to pull together a book that gave multiple examples from multiple contexts, mul multiple perspectives, really felt like a good way to address that question and demonstrate range um, of uses of the, camp, the CAS standards rather than just um, giving specific one campus examples. So it was really an opportunity to answer a question or, or begin to answer a question that had been coming to us for a long time. That's great. Um, so when you think about the process of developing a book, I mean, I imagine that's a, a lengthy process, somewhat of an iterative process. Um, how did you go about choosing the authors and the various topics that you chose to cover in this particular volume? Well, there was a really big spreadsheet involved in that. Um, as Alex pointed out, one of the things that we attempted to do was to introduce as many um, different kinds of examples as we could. So people who were new professionals, people who have been doing this work for decades, small campuses, large campuses, public, private, two-year schools, um, people who were upper level administrators, people who were on the ground in specific functional areas, because we wanted to help people think more broadly about what this could look like and, and put um, the biggest range in the book so everybody could find an aspect of what they were looking for. Um, so we began with what we knew about places where CAS is being used and being used well. Uh, Longwood University is one of the schools represented in the book and they have been long time users because one of the founders was the chief student affairs officer there for a long time. And so as we knew about places, um, we began to fill out that spreadsheet, but then we identified gaps and, and did some crowdsourcing, talked to our friends, talked to our colleagues and said, we need somebody to represent this. Who do you know out there that's doing good work? and put it together that way. We could have probably produced a book three times as long as we did. Um, getting those examples condensed enough to be a reasonable length was tough. Mm -hmm. Are there topics or chapters that you kind of wish you would have included, or if you had to go back and start over, you would <laughs> insert at this point? Or maybe that's book two. I think that may be book two. I, I don't know that there are specifics. I wish in some cases we could have given more than one example of the same thing so that people could see how, for example, two um, 
res life programs would use would do the same thing but do it differently so i think more examples of the same things rather than more things okay cool so I want to transition into talking about individual chapters. And so Shannon, you were not only an editor, but also a chapter author. And chapter two of the book talks about learning outcomes. Um, can you talk a little bit about the chapter and about kind of the importance of developing learning outcomes as a first step in our program design? Yeah, so we the chapter kind of outlines a little bit about what are learning outcomes just in general, right? What um, What's the difference between an outcome and an objective? And we throw these words around in, in student affairs a lot. And so what do those words actually mean? And how do we define them? And, and how do we make, make meaning of them? Um, and so it goes through that. And then it talks a lot about how do you actually develop those outcomes? So it's kind of a little bit of a how-to or a framework of sorts of actually developing outcomes. So it goes through, how do you make sure that they're measurable? How do you make sure that they're meaningful, um, right? And measurable outcomes is one of the hardest things, I think, for people to figure out how to write outcomes that are actually measurable. Um, and so it kind of outlines a process for that and it talks a little bit about, okay, think about your audience, right? Think about the behaviors or the experiences that you want students to go through. So it, it talks a lot about that. Um, and then, um, and just kind of gives that perspective of why they're important um, because oftentimes we uh, talk about these things and we espouse in higher education all of these really important outcomes or really important objectives, but we don't necessarily have ways to assess them. And so starting with those um, outcomes and those intended outcomes, what do we hope students learn as a result of our programs and the experiences that we provide for them, right? Um, what do we hope that they learn? And then how can we make those outcomes measurable so that on the back end, then we can assess it and say, yeah, we did we did meet that outcome, or maybe we need to adjust the outcome, or maybe we need to adjust the experience in order to um, better address that outcome. Okay, so one of the um, potential challenges is that we already have established at learning outcomes for our office. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about relating those established outcomes to CAS and how we might kind of integrate those learning and development outcomes better within our programs? Yeah, so I think one of the challenges to that um, and to kind of molding those two together is that you do have to have that buy-in, like you said, right? You have to have buy-in about the CAS standards and you have to have people in your institutions who believe in the CAS standards and, and see their value and purpose before I think you can kind of even go about merging those two. Um, I think it's also important that people understand kind of that the CAS standards aren't limiting. I think that that's one of the things that people often think like, oh, you know, I've got this one thing and I've got to follow it to a T. Um, and one of the things that I think is great about the book is that we talk about all the, the diverse ways that CAS is used. Um, and so it really provides different examples um, for if you already have established outcomes, how you can go about kind of merging those or how you can go ahead and use the CAS standards to start something new or even, um, you know, going, starting a new program based on CAS. I, I think there's so much diversity in the use of CAS um, that there's no one way to do it, which is part of both the challenge and the beauty of um, using the CAS standards and using the outcomes as your own. Wonderful. So Jen, your chapter, from the perspective of a division assessment officer, um, talks about how at the history of your institution and how kind of integrating CAS evolved. Um, we just got a great question from Twitter from Christopher Remley, um, who, who mentioned in their tweet, we just started using CAS to assess our office with the Institutional Research Office. So general advice from the start, and I thought this might kind of integrate a little bit with what your, um, your chapter was about as far as uh, the history and in integrating CAS um, was for you, so. Absolutely. Well, I think the first part for addressing the question is, I would say maybe connect with somebody. I do phone calls all the time and have a quick hour call about how do you get started with CAS. So, um, 
you know, I can't do that with everybody who watches, but I'd love to. Um, but I think connecting with somebody who's done that is a great way to get started, just to learn some of those pitfalls or areas that are helpful. And so I think getting started, I'm very excited to see that somebody's working with IR. Um, that's a really great thing because I think it's important for CAS to have a broader use. Uh, it's very helpful for student affairs, but I think the institution being able to understand that process more is a wonderful thing. Uh, for me, the chapter I really talk about, um, I wanted to title it Thinking Outside the CAS Box, although as Shannon has said, that's uh, more, that is part of the uses of CAS. Nancy mentioned that, that it is broader than what people think of. I think for the most part, we think about using the self-assessment guides and, you know, measuring ourselves against those and going through that program review process. But CAS can be used for so many different things. I'm known for the saying of like, CAS is your friend, but I mean that because it, it's there to be helpful to you. I, I always say there's no CAS police out there saying that's not the way it's supposed to be used. Now, if you are talking about a best practice, they CAS police may come land on top of you, but um, the Laura Dean CAS police. That's right. <laughs> yes. So, um, but really for me, when I took the position, it was a new position and I was charged with creating a strategic plan, creating learning and development outcomes and starting a culture of assessment where they were still asking if the students liked the food. Um, and it's, don't ask those questions. Um, and so I, you know, is really trying to change the culture. And for me, I think if you do sort of an analysis of learning outcomes out there, they're very similar. We use different words. Um, so for me, I was like, well, we're just going to adopt CAS. I'm not going to spend a year trying to use different words. Um, and so, and that was a really easy adoption. And I think people appreciated having the language there, having something they could adopt together and we could use it. Um, to frame our work going forward. And so that was really kind of how I went about that. And uh, there are a lot of leadership changes and validated with another institution, which I think made it prime for change and prime for us being able to move forward in the work that we were doing because we were having to ask ourselves the questions, uh, who are we serving? How do we best serve them? What is the work that we need to be doing? And, and so all of the opportunities kind of came around for um, CAS to really step in and be a great resource. Yeah, so I think um, one of the things you talk about in your chapter is, and you just mentioned it, around strategic planning. Um, and strategic planning is such a, a complicated process and oftentimes. How did you go about getting buy-in to integrate CAS, one, one other kind of area of complication potentially, um, into your strategic planning process? I will tell you, first, it was relationship building. I will tell you that for me was laying the groundwork for all of this was going around and talking to people. And I always talk about the why. And so why are we doing this? What is the value in doing this? Um, one of my phrases is that assessment should be meaningful and inform your work. But I also believe strategic planning should be that. Um, and, you know, I think in some ways, I validated people's concerns, too, because we talk about strategic planning being important, but not all of us are taught how to do that. We're not necessarily given the skill sets and it's not part of our everyday practice. In a lot of ways, people are being challenged to do so much more work. And a lot of it is the day to day, the hour to hour. It's trying to work through what we have on our plate and not sitting back and going, what are we strategically going to do? And even then strategic plans, it's often difficult to think about what do we want to be different in five years, three years, seven years, however long the strategic plan is. It's not a restatement of what we're currently doing, which is what people's natural tendency has been, at least in my experiences. I want to put down the work I do. Well, it's not about you can keep doing your work, but how do we want to be different? And I think CAS gave us some language to be able to say this is where we want to go. Um, this is how we can integrate this to be different, to be better, to get ourselves further in. And I, I think that's how I go about doing that. And I think it's a selling of we don't necessarily always tell our stories. We don't shout out the great things that we're doing often enough. And this is a way of making that formal and being able to tell the story. And I will always say by and large, it's so much more rewarding to talk about the learning and development that is occurring than rather people just had a good time. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. So the other piece related to that then is on the other end is the reporting piece. And you provided um, a template or an example of a template for um, a annual report. And it seemed like that would be a really good tool to kind of increase alignment and talk about accountability and, and tell that story. Did you find that to be true? I think it, it definitely gave a guidance for people. I will tell you the challenge in the beginning is that everybody wanted to say that they were addressing all 28. <laughs> um, and so I told people like if anybody marked more than like 10 boxes, they got an F and I made it sort of a joke, like a funny, like I'm going to X that and turn it back and you can provide a new draft. But I think it was that we want to believe that every, we do everything. And I think there's this fear about accountability right now. And there's such a uh, strong charge to providing evidence that you're making an impact, that you're doing all these things that you're supposed to be doing. And, um, so we want to say we're doing all of this. And so it gave good conversation that I, somebody mentioned earlier, like what is the purpose of what we're doing? Um, so it's what, if we are really having to focus, what do we want to know about our students? What do we want them to learn? How do we want them to develop? But it, it forced people to have that conversation. Um, and I also said to somebody, well, if residence life can do all 28 on their own, then why is everybody else here? Um, and I said, so when we talk about being a division and if part of the um, part of what we want to do is create this culture and be more cohesive and have collaboration, well, then we're going to be stronger together. So if everybody is taking some of the pieces and together we're addressing all the learning outcomes, then that makes us a stronger division and tells a better story about the impact that we're making broadly on campus. That's great. So Alex, um, in your chapter, you talked about um, the CAS standard from the lens of a specific standard for mm -hmm. LGBT programs and services, and you provided kind of an in-depth application. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you wrote? Yeah, so for me, I think uh, I'll back up uh, and think too that it was really important that we're talking about a large public institution yeah. and how that the standards were operating there. So one is, um, kind of opposite gen, right? I'm a, I, I am or was a new professional as of last Friday. Um, and um, I, I'm not the director of assessment for a division. So how do I help build a culture of assessment from the bottom up, right? And thinking about bottom up and trickle up approaches to creating cultures in our divisions is really important to me. And CAS really gives me that. So in my chapter, I really talk about how CAS standards um, are really a flexible and versatile tool to use as a new professional to create a culture of assessment within the specific function we're talking about. Um, so for me, my chapter talked about learning outcomes, as Shannon talked about. It talked about using self-assessment guides, but doing also institutional advocacy, right? Um, one of uh, one of the things that we have really talked about is what is the language which our administrators hear or resonate with? And for some, that is student stories. For some, that is measurable learning outcome data. For some, that is meeting national standards like CAS, which when you uh, bridge it to other, other organizations, actually has a lot of matching with organizations like AAC and U um, or AAU, which our, our Michigan State's president really um, uh, uh, vibes with. Um, and then the other thing that I, don't really talk about in the chapter, something I would actually go back and add if I could, is that casting, I've been thinking more and more about cast standards as historical documents of the student affairs profession. Um, uh, and really thinking about how cast standards really reflect how we think about the historical evolution of functional areas and functions at our institutions that many of us don't have access to, right? Um, in comparison to housing or orientation, multicultural affairs as a formalized functional area is still pretty young, especially LGBT uh, Q student services, right? Um, and so this cast standards give me a lens of what have we been doing and where do we need to go? as well. That's great. One of the things that I know you and I have talked about at Michigan State is that we have established university undergraduate learning goals and yeah. I appreciated um, about how you talked how that can integrate with CAS as, as kind of a both and approach. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me more about how you thought about that regarding your office. Yeah, so I think what is um, 
thinking through learning goals, we all have them at our institutions. I have now worked at four different institutions, either as a grad or as a full-time employee, and everyone sort of has a framework of student success, whether that's on the academic side, the student affairs side, or on both. Um, hopefully they share, right, because we're all going for the same mission, ideally. Um, but how do we create local solutions at our institutions and do that in a globally informed way. So the CAS standards are really that global and information way of thinking about our work and student affairs. And then we all have different things that happen at our local institutions, right? Michigan State is in Michigan. It's in the most segregated state in the K-12 system in the United States, right? So I have to think differently about my practice than someone in Georgia or someone in California, right? And so the cast standards give me a way to start thinking about it. And then I think about what our local outcomes are saying. And sometimes our local outcomes don't include things I need to address and the cast standards do or the CAS standards don't have something I need to include and our local outcomes too. So it's really about thinking about how, this, how these tools build a broader picture, uh, picture of developing the whole student, right? We talk about the whole student or holistic development, but we can't do that piecemeal. We need, we sort of need each other um, in these abstract documents to sort of make these things happen uh, really tangibly on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Alex, uh, you talked about using the CAS standards specifically around benchmarking, advocacy, mm -hmm. self-assessment. Um, I'd love to hear more about that because I know for a lot of folks, at least in my previous role as a director of a women's center, I was able to hold up the standards and say, look, this is what we're supposed to be or should be doing or must yep. be doing. Yep. Um, did you find that same kind of application? Yeah. Additionally, what we what we were sort of smart about is we looked at other functional area standards. So we looked at, for instance, the housing and residence life standards to say, how should housing and residence life be doing things with LGBT students, right? Um, not just looking at our own standards and holding ours up, but saying, uh, yours also say this, right? Um, and sort of using multiple data points to talk about how um, these things seem to come together. And, and I'll say too, CAS standards, I think, have been a way for for me to think about the political frame for those who have studied Bowman and Deal's organizational frames, to really think about how um, the standards give us a form of legitimacy. We can question why they do versus why other forms of legitimacy are not legitimate. Uh, yeah, that, that works. Um, but, but thinking about how um, adhering to national standards is something that certain administrators at our institution love. And they would love to tout that. And so, so saying, well, you know, here's this thing we can be touting, but we're not doing it yet, right? Mm -hmm. um, we also learned in this process that we can't, cast standards can't be the only thing that we use for our advocacy. While they are a tool in that belt, they aren't the whole belt. And so, you know, the Consortium of Higher Education LGBT Research Center Professionals, also known as the Consortium, um, has also published updates and guides over the years that we used in conjunction with the standards to inform a more holistic report, which I talk about in my chapter, of where we need to go as an institution still, specifically around gender and gender identity. Um, you know, it's not lost on me that this morning, you know, um, our commander in chief, you know, talks about transgender exclusion from the military, right? And how things are literally changing on an everyday basis related to gender and the law and policy. And so CAS standards, rightfully can't keep up with that, but they can help inform where we start, right? And that's the real beauty of it, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you, thank you. Um, so Yancy, in your summarizing chapter, um, you kind of discuss the important considerations for using CAS in practice, and specifically around transparency and buy-in and getting stakeholders all at the same page. Um, one of the things that I that I learned in talking with a couple of people about this um, is that there's some challenges, right, of the practical application of CAS. So some people said, well, who has time to integrate this really overwhelming document? You know, how do I get buy-in? You know, how do I choose CAS among other measures? You know, can you talk a little bit about how, and I think you talked about this in your chapter, how you respond to those challenges around practical application of CAS? Sure. I think one of the first things is to, to note that those challenges are real. I mean, these are honest things that are a problem mm -hmm. um, on our campuses. Uh, our campuses, no matter, and I've worked at small to your privates, I've worked at community colleges, I've worked at big land grant four years, they're all unwieldy. 
um, change comes with difficulty. Um, and so I think you know, honoring that that is difficult, but the challenges can be overcome. And we have, again, chapter after chapter in this book of people telling their story about how they did that. And that was one of the interesting findings that after we got all of our chapters together, I think um, Shannon, Laura, and I kind of talked about them and said, oh, there's some unintended outcomes here that we didn't see kind of, that were going to come through. The fact that every chapter talks about getting buy-in. Um, which is not a prompt we gave for them. Um, but everyone kind of intuitively knew they had to talk about that as a base for even being able to do this work at their institutions. Um, so again, it goes back to how important that piece is. And when I, I talk about doing this kind of work, using CAST or doing assessment in general or, or using standards of, of, of practice, I always talk, it seems overwhelming, especially if you pick up the blue book, right, in our ninth edition. If you pick it up, it looks overwhelming because you assume, oh my goodness, how am I, as the director of the Career Center, going to make housing start using these? Well, you know what? You're the director of the Career Center. That's not your job. That is outside <laughs> of your locus of control. <laughs> so, but what you can do is use these standards in your function and with your staff. So I think it's about starting with that locus of control and, and doing what you can in your area. And then, even if you're just, not say just, but even if you are you know, fresh starting out, you're not even a director yet, you are you know, a program planner for the Career Center. Well, what about that one program? Can you use CAS to help with that one program? And then is that can, what we know from these chapters is that that kind of work is contagious, and we start seeing that flow across our own offices and into other offices. Especially, another tip is if we're intentional about building a team to do assessment, even for our own program, it's really helpful to get an outside perspective, right? Because we're in it. Like you can't smell the odors in your own house because they're the odors of your own house. Um, but you know, you invite somebody else over and they know you're the crazy cat lady. Like it's really simple to figure out it's from the outside. Um, so, invite someone else into your house. It teaches them how to use the CAS standards as well as gives you a fresh perspective that you need, um, which is really difficult. Um, it's another thing I would say. Um, in terms of getting buy-in, you know, Jen talked about this a little bit earlier about that relationship building. You know, it's about sitting down. Alex talked about it too. Um, you know, if, if, if you have someone on your campus who really loves national benchmarking, it might be helpful to show them a big national book that talks about standards. Um, that might say more than you talking for hours on end even. Um, so that's, I think, helpful. It's also helpful to think about doing this work takes both cosmopolitans and locals. Um, and if you don't know that language, it's, it's from organizational development field from, I think, back in the 50s, actually, was when it first started coming about being used. Um, but it takes people who have been on the ground in institutions for a long time, those people who know where all the skeletons are buried, um, who are going to let you try your newfound ideas, you know, in their space. Um, so you need a mix of both of those kinds of people on your teams. I think that can be really helpful. And the last thing I'll say is that you, you mentioned about um, how to choose this amongst other tools. I think that we have a lot of tools out there. We have a lot of national surveys, for example. We have a lot of national instruments out there that are very good and useful and can be a good companion um, to any kind of assessment um, or, or quality um, enhancement plans that we put into our institutions, right? I think they're helpful. So many of them talk about satisfaction, though, and student satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And I often controversially say, I don't care much about student satisfaction because. If we are satisfied, we are not uncomfortable. And if we are not uncomfortable, we are not learning because cognitive dissonance is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so if we only ask about satisfaction alone and not learning and development, as Shannon was talking about, then we're not getting at what we need to get at. And I think the beauty of CAS is that it is flexible. In the standards, you can, you can say within that career services set of standards, these six make sense for my institution and my institutional mission and my institutional um, geography, right? And the rest don't make sense. So I'm going to use these and build off of them some other outcomes. Um, so I think that's the beauty of it is that it, it is much more than many other instruments we have or standards we have out there. 
um, it's flexible for institutional use in ways the others just are not. Um, and I think it can be really helpful, again, in companion with those sometimes, but, but really making our institutional mission paramount to what we're trying to accomplish with any of our practice. Great. So, Laura, and this is related to what you were just saying, um, Yancy, is that you you did focus intentionally on different types of institutions, different institutional contexts um, to talk about practical application. I mean, there were probably other ways to organize the book, right, and not talk about institutional contexts, but maybe talk about functional areas or levels within the profession. Um, can you talk about why you specifically chose to focus on institutional type? Sure. I, I think um, two sides of the same coin. Institution type tends to be one of the massive variables each of us is, is aware of when we work in the field. For a long time, I worked at small privates. That was sort of where my practitioner career was. Other people have worked at massive land grants and whatnot. And I think we tend to be very immersed in the particular unique characteristics of that kind of institution type. Um, we're not as good as a profession, I think, at recognizing that some things are true regardless of the kind of institution where you work. So I think it was both a desire to offer those examples so that anyone in any kind of institution type could see themselves, but also really try to say, there are lessons for you in all of these chapters. So even if I'm working at a small private, what Alex has to say about what the work looks like at a large public is still valid. So we try to bring those things together. One of the things that I would also say, echoing what Yancy was talking about, is that in the founding of CAS, our founders made a really deliberate and I think um, in retrospect wise choice between accreditation and self-study. Um, there was a lot of talk about quality assurance in the late 70s into the early 80s, and some of those conversations yielded accreditation models for counseling and related educational programs and that kind of thing. And this group of people said, you know what, the work looks different on different campuses. The work looks different if I've got a total staff of 12 or if I've got a total staff of 1,200. And so we need to write these standards so that they can be applied regardless of those contexts and yet still speak to the threshold of good practice that ought to be achievable regardless of where you are. So I think in the very philosophy and structure of the standards, you get that variety, but also the necessity for people to interpret what that means in their own context. So one of the chapters also that really interested me, which kind of brings in another way of organizing this potentially, is about cross-functional standards. Um, Lena Kavaluskas crane um, makes the case for some kind of cross-functional standard and as currently working in an academic living learning community focused on environmental sustainability, there's no such standard um, or clear-cut standard for that. Um, and I know all, many of you have comments about this on here, but Laura, can you talk a little bit about how this might be an emerging, more practical application for CAS? Absolutely. I, I'll give a little context and then I'll invite Jen in to talk a little bit about sort of late breaking news from CAS. Um, one of the things that's true is that CAS over time has um, created a lot of sets of standards, right? We've got 45 now, I think. And so, there is um, always the challenge when a new idea comes up of whether this really is a standalone function that needs its own standards or whether this is something that sort of cuts across areas and brings in things that always ex already exist. And so the reality is our campuses are structured and organized so differently that we can't possibly write a set of standards for every combination of functions out there. You know, inevitably there's going to be the small college office that does activities and orientation and leadership and maybe service learning. And so at the next campus, that's a different combination. So I think Lena's chapter was a, a wonderful example of how you can customize using those pieces to shape what's happening on your own campus and, and shape standards for that. The other side of that, though, is that there are some combinations that happen more typically than others, and that leads to a current conversation in CAS that I'll let Jen talk about. Jen? 
So I think it, I mean, it's pretty exciting to announce and some may or may not be aware of this, but we're currently piloting two sets of cross-functional standards. So first year experience and high risk behaviors. And the idea behind this is that it generally tends to be more of a team approach. So there is some focus on the team and what the team is supposed to do, but it also looks at how to then do you address the work and how do you assess the work that you're doing? And so they will look different than the uh, way the standards look right now. Um, but we're under a pilot because it is new. So we have some very in different institutional types working on um, giving us some feedback related to these cross-functional standards. But ideally, you'll be able to see them probably come January of the next year after we um, vote on them in November. So stay tuned. But with that, we're also looking at this idea of multifunctional standards where um, some of the people who are at small institutions, there's one person per office. And so how do you take those standards, put them together and make meaning for them in your own context, um, which is a little bit different than this idea of the cross-functional where it's more of a topic you know, first year experience rather than um, where it's different offices working together under one umbrella. And so um, great, exciting things for CAS. I think some of this work, we, we're listening to the feedback and as a sort of a side note, continue to talk to us there, make a little plug. We have some CAS users groups now on Facebook for two year and four year. And so find us, join and get the dialogue started. Um, one of the things I'm most excited about this book is that it has created this dialogue where we're getting questions about cross-functional, where we're putting out the work that CAS is doing and we're connecting um, to make sure that we're, you know, doing the things that we say that we, <laughs> it's important for all of you to do. Uh, so connect with us, keep, keep talking. Now the functional areas aren't going away. Market research tells us that everybody still likes those functional areas yet. Don't worry, it's just there's going to be more variety. That's good. That's great. Um, so other takeaways. I think, I, I think we're about ready to wrap up for today. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, as we always end every episode, you know, folks watch episodes of Hired Live and want to kind of continue a conversation. You know, beyond buying the copy of the book, of course, hold up your copies of the book. I know a couple of you have them on your desk. There you go. <laughs> um, beyond getting a copy of the book, uh, what other resources do you, do you have? Conference presentations in the works, um, other types of articles that you'd like to refer folks to. Um, and so, Laura, why don't I start with you if you have other thoughts to share? I, the one thing that I would say first is spend some time on the CAS website. Uh, it's just cas.edu, it's easy to find. And there is a lot there. There are educational resources, there are PowerPoints, there are lists of all the standards, there are lists of the member organizations. One of the things I think we haven't talked probably as much about as some other things today is that CAS as a consortium group made up of professional associations that are the members. And at those professional conferences, um, there are also training sessions and presentations that are happening for people in those functional areas, as well as the ones at ACP and NASPA for more general audiences. And so I think we, we really try through the membership on the board who are the representatives from those professional organizations to have people out there active with their own membership in their own areas um, promulgating the work. And so look to those areas as well as some of the more uh, general things. There's a lot on the website if you dig there. Cool, great. Um, Shannon, other resources beyond what she's just talked about? <laughs> no, those are some great resources she mentioned. I think too, one of the really important things is if you're really interested in doing this work is getting connected with other professionals on your campus, people who are already doing it, whether that's just assessment in general or actually using CAS, um, because those resources are gonna make you a better professional and strengthen that. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff, uh, like Laura said, on the website that will help give you more information about CAS um, before looking at that big blue book, right? Um, that just gives you a starting place um, and lots of helpful information that's all free. Excellent. Alex? So um, I would say that I'm going to echo the CAS website piece. But I'm going to refer to a specific page to the learning outcomes and development out learning and development outcomes page. It is probably my most visited page on the CAS website. 
So I am a believer that, again, you should take sort of global frameworks and apply them locally. Um, CAST literally has six dimensions of outcomes, and there's over 100 already written. So when we talk about creating learning outcomes, when we talk about um, uh, being intentional about our work, uh, there are already outcomes written, right? Literally have the language that we're looking for, have the Bloom's taxonomy verb that I always struggle with, um, already there. And so I would say if folks are looking specifically to start somewhere with CAS, everyone's going to do learning outcomes. And so that's a place where everyone can sort of attach themselves to. I would also recommend, I know it's in the fifth edition of Student Services, a handbook for the profession, but there's a chapter in there about the purpose of intentionality in our work. And I know that sounds sort of um, oxymoronic and, and ironic that like, oh, we have to talk about a chapter about being intentional. Um, but there is something to be said about magical thinking in the field that things are just gonna magically happen without intention. And so that chapter is something I've actually referred um, grad students that I've mentored to back to all the time. It's in the fifth edition of the book, I believe it's by Sean Harper. Um, and it really talks about the role of intentionality in student affairs. And I think cast standards help us be intentional in student affairs. Great. Thanks for referencing that, giving us a correct edition and everything, Alex. True doc student. Jen. Uh, I absolutely echo everything everybody has already said, but I, I'm obviously going to encourage you to purchase the ninth edition of the book. Um, it, somebody once said to me, well, Jen, I read that book and I laughed and I said, no, you didn't. Um, that's not what it's meant for. It really is the resource and it seems lofty. And as Yancey message mentioned, it can be overwhelming. It's meant to be a resource. But when you pick up that book, read the first two chapters. That is going to give all of the information that you need. Um, it's really going to give you a good basis about CAS. So I encourage everybody who gets that to read those first two chapters. Read the contextual uh, statement for your functional area too. It also it lets you know where we're getting the information to drive those standards. Um, and on the CD and for the self-assessment guides, it really does give a lot of information on how you go about this process. So I'm going to encourage you to use the official CAS resources. One thing I want to mention, which I've learned because I've been listening and asking questions and trying to uh, change materials, address the needs, um, you know, all the basic assessment terms. But we've learned that we have editions of the book. And so sometimes with editions, there's very few changes that occur. And so some people think that if I have the seventh edition, I'm okay. Um, those editions are overhauled. And so if you're using a seventh edition, you are not up to date on your standards. You can purchase individual standards on the website, but know that when we call them editions, they are fully updated. Um, so we look at the general standards often, which are infused without all the functional area standards. Um, you know, we could have spent another hour just talking about CAS in general, um, but I think using the mixture of the ninth edition with this text is about as powerful of a resource as you can get. Great. Yancy, final resources for you. Yeah, I think my colleagues are, are spot on with what they're saying. Um, I'll circle back though to part of your original question about other conference presentations or those kind of things. You know, I will say we, we have done um, our authors uh, and as editors, we've done some sessions at NASPA and ACPA this last year in March as the book was launched. Um, and I think we'll probably do a bit more of that in the future um, in, in other ways. I haven't even talked to my colleagues here about that, but I've been having some ideas in my head. Um, you know, ACPA, um, their Commission on Assessment and Evaluation does a um, every summer an ass assessment institute. So I was, uh, had the pleasure of being on faculty for that this summer. And there's lots of conversation around this same topic and ideas of how people want to use CAS on their campus and how to do that. Um, I think NASPA does a similar kind of institute focused on, focused on assessment. I'm not sure if they do it annually or biannually, but um, I think those for people who want to have these conversations. And again, my colleagues talked about making connections with people also doing this work if they're not on your campus and you can make connections that way. So that might be really um, a helpful place for people to find more resources and more of this conversation beyond what my colleagues have said. 
Excellent. Okay, final thoughts. One sentence is my challenge to each of you. <laughs> um, Alex, do you want to start? Yes. Cast standards are a player on the basketball team, colon, you can choose to bench them. It's not wise to bench them, but they are definitely a contributor to the greater team. Hashtag, I don't do sports. <laughs> very nice. Very good. That's very like processing. OK. Um, <laughs> Yancy, final thoughts? Um, I mean, my final thoughts are, are this. Uh, you know, we've been really passionate about this, as you can tell, um, and I hope the audience can tell. Um, it, it, this is doable work. It's exciting work once you're getting into it. Um, if this book is helpful, grab a copy. If just, you know, if you're grabbing the, the ninth edition of the Cast Interest themselves is helpful, grab a copy. Get your library to get a copy of this. Um, on your campuses. It's really inexpensive. We're getting no money for it. Um, we did this out of the goodness of our hearts. Obviously, that's not a sales pitch for our pockets. Um, but we intentionally kept it small and inexpensive so that it's accessible against those various institutional types that we may know may not be able to afford um, everything they want at all times. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and very readable too, I was going to say. Um, it's very accessible, easy to read, um, and super applicable. Um, Shannon, final thought? Yeah, I, I would say if this is something you're passionate about, figure out what your sphere of influence is and how you can impact your campus in that way. And then connect with us. If you have further questions about the book or about the chapters, um, I know Jen said too that she enjoys talking with people about this. We all are very passionate about it. And so if you want to connect with us, we're, we're more than willing. Great. Jen. It's okay to start small. Um, don't be afraid to just take one step forward, even if it's just looking at the mission. Um, so just don't feel like you have to jump all the way in. You can kind of put a toe in and just feel out the water a little bit. Um, but in, in conclusion, Cass is your friend and so am I. <laughs> Jen will take personal calls from everyone. No. <laughs> um, lots of metaphors today. Uh, Laura, your final thoughts. I would say that CAS um, keeps us rooted and grounded in good practice, and it also keeps us connected to others across the field, across our institutions who are trying to do the good work of contributing to student learning and student success. Great. Great. Well, thank you again to all of you for sharing um, this resource with all of us for this really fun and engaging hour plus that we all spent together. Thank you to our program sponsors, ACPA and M. Stoner. Um, so to preview some upcoming an upcoming episode in three weeks on Student Affairs Live, I will be back with a panel talking about athletics and student affairs partnerships for student success um, with DT Henry and some others um, who do that work on our institution's campuses. And you can receive reminders about this and other episodes by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter, browsing our archives at higheredlive.com. Um, again, my name is Heather Shea. Thanks again to our fabulous panelists and everyone for watching. Make it a great week.